I have been managing a fairly large community composting facility for years. It is a core part of this Red Gardens project where most of the organic material generated in the gardens and in the surrounding landscape is mixed in with the household compost from our own house and from quite a few of my neighbors. And this provides an essential source of soil amendment and fertility for the vegetable gardens. And the methods that I use to manage this composting facility have evolved over the years with significant changes since I last talked about it almost five years ago. The main purpose of the changes were to reduce the amount of work that it takes to manage the substantial amount of material, which was possible in part because of changes in how I've been controlling the rock population. I also made a series of panels for creating the compost containers, which enabled me to easily set up each new compost pile and to allow a lot more air into the material, which improves the decomposition process. And this focus on built infrastructure and changes in simple processes have drastically reduced the amount of work that I need to put in. And I still end up with good quality compost in the end. And all of the numerous people who add material to this compost still only need to follow the one rule. This composting area started as a way for me to recycle old plants and other garden wastes, as well as material from the surrounding landscape, into a useful soil amendment and source of fertility for the vegetable gardens. And this gradually developed to the point where over 30 households use this facility for most of their compostable material, as well as all the material that they add from the gardens. In the process, I became the manager of a significant community composting facility, all without any signs, instructions, or notices. There is quite a lot of material going through this system, uh, with a large bin being filled over the course of about a month, and I try to keep everything simple, especially for all those people adding material. I have always been keen to avoid the typical advice, rules and restrictions that are usually associated with small-scale or household composting, mainly because I believe that we need to find ways to deal with all of the potentially problematic material within local compost systems, rather than sending it all away to somebody else to deal with. I used to refer to this as the no rules compost, because from the standpoint of my community, for the people who add material to the compost, they can ignore the rules they typically come across about what they can and cannot add. But there is actually one rule relating to material added to the compost system, that people can add anything that was recently alive, including plants and vegetable scraps of course, but also cooked meat, bones, oils, bread, citrus, as well as pernicious weeds, diseased plants, cardboard, paper, and even dead chickens and some roadkill have gone in. And the challenge for me was to adapt the system to be able to handle this continuous flow of a wide mix of different material and to make it easy for everyone else to use and so that they didn't need to find other composting systems to handle the material that is usually seen as problematic. The last time I talked about this, the system I had been using was managing all of this for the most part. But it was way too much work for me and had a few other issues. But I have since changed a few things so that it is much easier and simple for all of us, as well as being tidier. The old system was based on piles of compost that moved, each one being turned 7 to 10 times before being ready to use. It started in two bins made out of scrap plywood with holes drilled in for a bit of air and a makeshift lid, with the first bin designated for loading, which was emptied into the second bin when it became too full, and then was turned into loose piles of compost after that. The challenge for me was to turn all of the piles in the row so that there was space to empty the main loading bin when it became full. This was a lot of work and a lot of digging to move all these piles, and I occasionally built separate larger compost piles during the active growing season for the large amounts of material from the gardens and surrounding landscape so that the bin would not fill so quickly. But this separation of material wasn't ideal, as I found it was a lot better to mix it all in together. I tried a few options to reduce this workload, but ended up adopting a system where the loading bin itself moved instead of the piles of compost. This reduced the pressure on me to turn the compost in time, as well as the amount of work involved as each batch was only turned once or twice in total, and the bin could fill quickly when there was lots of material to add, and I could simply move it to the next location and start a new bin. The one main benefit to the old system was that all of the compost was turned quite regularly, which mixed and incorporated all of the material, and it also added air into the mix, which helped to speed up the decomposition process. 
This was important, as I never felt that I had enough compost available each season, so was keen for the whole process to speed up. But a few years ago, I began to buy in additional finished municipal compost in large bags and even larger quantities, and this took pressure off, which meant that the whole process could slow down, allowing the decomposition to take longer and for the stock of my own compost to build up. The other benefit of turning was to prevent sections of the compost pile from becoming anaerobic, where the supply of oxygen ran out, which slowed down decomposition, smelt really bad, and became a source of methane. I have become increasingly concerned about the production of this potent greenhouse gas within the composting process. And although I have no idea how much methane gas could potentially be produced in a problematic compost pile at this scale, I wanted to greatly reduce the possibility. Maintaining a good mix of material definitely helped the situation, but I decided to make the enclosing sides of the compost bin out of wire mesh stapled to a wooden frame. This is obviously much better at allowing air into the mix of decomposing material than holes drilled in a sheet of plywood. And more recently, I built bases of heavy-duty wire mesh held off the ground to allow air to flow underneath, and it also lets excess liquid drain away. Allowing air to access a large volume of material from all sides and top and bottom seems to have greatly reduced the chance of anaerobic conditions occurring, and I rarely come across those foul-smelling sections anymore, even though the compost is turned less frequently. The other big reason for regularly turning the compost piles was to deal with the rats that would inevitably be attracted. Avoiding rats is one of the main reasons for the rules restricting certain types of material being added to the compost. Though I have found that rats are attracted to all kinds of compost piles, even if none of this problematic material is added. I had taken quite a different approach to this issue, which suited me at the time and the context that I was operating in, and was content to attract the rats to the compost bin to eat what was there rather than eating the vegetables in my gardens. And I hoped that they would build their nests in the compost piles so that I could trap and kill them. When I regularly dug over and turned all of the compost piles, I would typically find rats' nests, and I would kill all the rats that I could, either directly or with the help of a neighbor's dog, or with various other methods to trap them as they ran away. But in the last few years, I changed to a method of using a flame-weeding torch to fill the burrows and nests with heat, smoke, and other harmful gases. By sealing off all of the entrances to the nest, except for the one where I place the torch into, I could much more successfully and very quickly kill the nests and any rats trapped inside. This changed a lot, as it meant that I could much more effectively control the rat population in the compost piles and in the whole area around the gardens, and it meant that I didn't have to turn or dig out the compost piles in order to deal with the rat issue. The other big changes are the purpose-built structures that I've been slowly constructing. First was the front and back panels made from old chicken wire mesh stapled to a treated wooden frame, with the front slightly higher than the back. This allowed a plastic covered frame to serve as a lid that would shed the rainfall to the back of the line of compost piles. Originally, I used modified pallets as dividers between the batches of compost, but have gradually replaced these with stronger welded wire mesh fixed to the same type of treated wood frame. These are lighter and longer lasting, and also prevented the rats from burrowing between the piles, which makes them easier to deal with. I then built a wooden frame hood lined with the same reused plastic silage cover for covering the bin that is currently being filled, to keep the rain off and preventing the material from blowing away too much, but to still allow easy access. And finally, I used a heavy gauge welded wire mesh held off the ground by a wooden base with holes drilled in it to allow enough airflow to the bottom of the pile, but strong enough to hold up the weight. And all of this is easily screwed together, then unscrewed and moved and reassembled whenever I need to start a new compost pile. When a compost bin is almost full, I unscrew the panels from the oldest pile and construct another empty bin at the end of the line. First the space is cleared, the base screen placed on the ground, and the front, back and side panels are screwed together and to the existing structure. I unscrew the hood from the previous bin and move it to the new bin and screw it into place, and the new container is now ready to use. I then cover the recently filled compost pile with a lid and let it sit for a while longer. After a few weeks, when this material starts to cool down a bit, I take the lid off of this full bin as well as off of the empty bin beside it and remove the front panel. I then fork all of the material from one bin into the next, trying to bring the material from the outside into the center. 
This turning mixes the material up a bit and adds a lot of oxygen, which allows the whole pile to heat up again, and this is the only time that I turn the compost until it is almost fully decomposed. I then remove the base screen and set it aside for the next new pile, and replace the front panel and lid so that the space is ready for the currently active pile to be turned into when the cycle repeats. I like this compost system as it has developed to this point at least, but there have been a few issues and it did take me a while and a fair amount of material to build all of the panels, bases and lids. I have enough sets of panels for four bins, including the currently active one, which I think is the bare minimum I need, but a few more would work well, and I will probably eventually replace the chicken wire on the front and back panels with a stronger welded wire mesh. I also need to line the plastic lids with chicken wire or something else in order to prevent whatever it is from clawing through the plastic, probably in search of rats. With this system involving less turning, it does take longer for the material to decompose, but it is a lot less work and a lot tidier, though it does take up more space. And the size of the container is big enough to allow the material to heat up enough in order to kill a lot of the weed roots, seeds, and disease organisms, but it still seems to be small enough to let in enough air to the core of the pile to prevent anaerobic conditions from forming. I have space for about 14 sections or batches in the row, and I tend to start a new pile about every month, so I would need to move the compost on within about a year to make space for the next round when I start the process from the bottom again. But because I've recently bought in a lot of compost, I have let the compost piles build up perhaps too much, and they are getting in the way even after consolidating the material into larger builders bags. So I have started to screen the material into large bags to mature some more and to move it out of the way of the line of bins and it will be nice to have a large supply of compost ready to add to the gardens in preparation for the next season. So the basic premise of this community composting facility has not changed but the way that I manage it has evolved quite a bit to make it easier and more effective. I move the bins regularly and turn the compost a lot less, and buying in other compost for a few seasons has taken the pressure off so that I could wait for the slower decomposition process to catch up. The lightweight panels and lids are easy to take apart, move and reassemble, and they let in a lot more air to reduce the chance of methane being produced and the decomposition process slowing down too much. And I can do all of this because I have a much more effective way of controlling the rot population that doesn't involve the frequent turning of the compost piles. The lids are useful for keeping out the excessive amounts of rain, but I do occasionally need to add water to make sure that there is enough moisture for the whole process to work effectively. And I do need to keep an eye on things to make sure that there is a reasonable mix of material, but most of the time it seems fine. The whole facility is a lot tidier and easier to access than it used to be, and the prominent hood makes it easy to identify where the household compostable material is supposed to go. And as far as all of the people in my community who use this composting facility are concerned, the rule is basically still the same. They can add anything that was recently alive. And I get a lot of good quality compost at the end of the process for use in my vegetable gardens. The evolution of this compost system over the years has been a really valuable lesson for me because it's shown in a very direct way how what we do is often the combination of a whole bunch of different factors or techniques or methods that we try to work with. And more importantly, the change in one of those factors or one of those methods can actually enable the fundamental change of the whole system itself. And I think this is one of the greatest benefits of this Red Gardens project that I've been working on where I explore a lot of different things and try out a lot of different methods and techniques and I'm often in a situation where I can compare and contrast all those different possibilities. I think this is a great way to learn and I share as much as I can through these videos. If you value the work that I do in this Red Gardens project and appreciate the videos that I make, it would be great if you consider supporting me and this project through Patreon or PayPal. But most importantly, thank you for watching.